All right, sorry about that. Okay, so welcome today. And, um, you know, this is a live stream where we talk about MLOps or, you know, machine learning and how to take machine learning solutions to, um, you know, back to, you know, reality to, to make them into products. And we understand trends, tools, software systems, you know, in order to help us do that. Today, I wanted to keep it a, a shorter session, but I wanted to talk about some of the startups that are coming up in the area of MLOps. So uh, MLOps is, is relatively a newer, you know, newer term. It's, it's a newer area. I will also show you if I do a keyword search of MLOps in LinkedIn, you will see that there are, at least in, in North America now, there are at least like 6,000, 8,000 jobs. So a lot of companies are actually now opening up MLOps engineer roles, which you know, before the, the summer in 2021, it didn't even exist. And then there are a lot of communities in, in MLOps. So there's MLOps World, there's MLOps con Conferences. They are coming together to talk about more of the, pro of the practices and of the different methods and means that these uh, companies use so that everybody learns from one another and they, you know, take a shorter time to start, um, you know, from your machine learning algorithm and, and take it to production. So, like I mentioned, today I wanted to focus a little more on, um, you know, the, the startups that have uh, come up over, you know, the, the recent year. So, let's dive straight into it. All right. So, all right. So, let's start with the first article. So I'm going to be showing a couple of articles today, and uh, we're just going to be reviewing them in order to, you know, see uh, what are the different patterns that, that do come up from, uh, from, from there. So the first article, and, and I'm going to be posting all of these uh, in the description box below, but this is actually the, this Venture Beat article. It talks about the state of MLOps in 2021, and it's very clear that MLOps is majorly being done by startups. And uh, larger companies, they are still, there. there might be one wing you know, that is uh, catering to MLOps, uh, like, you know, Volvo cars and autonomous drive, they have uh, a whole team working on it. Uh, NVIDIA, there are definitely MLOps engineers role for hardware. Uh, but mostly, you know, most of the experimentation or most of the work that is happening in the industry right now is happening in startups. So if you're really excited about MLOps, then, you know, a startup is, is where you should be at. Um, and, you know, most of this is because the, the envisioned uh, idea is data science means uh, data scientists typically they, they, you know, work with Jupyter notebooks and, you know, you start your algorithm on a Jupyter notebook and you end it on a Jupyter notebook. But the idea is, you know, you should be able to then deploy it so that you don't just end on a Jupyter notebook or on a demo, but you are essentially able to do more with it. So, uh, and, you know, someone else is able to utilize that. So there could be a, a morphing or a, you know, strategic move in the industry where data science rules then becomes get morphed with MLOps in so that, um, you know, the final goal is not just uh, the, the Jupyter notebook, but actually a deployed solution. So um, let's look at some of the, you know, major MLOp startups that have been pointed out in this article. Um, like it's mentioned, 88% of the state of MLOps are startups right now. And if you, if you see some of the major names, Databricks, Data Robot, Algorithmia, and they have literally raised, uh, you know, the, the most amount of funding in this case. Now, Databricks is, is again, pretty, uh, they, they've been around for, for quite some amount of time. And uh, they were, you know, for one of the first few who actually started, you know, working on, uh, you know, distributed compute. So if you want to do Spark, uh, the MLlib library, it is, uh, you know, incorporated into that platform. MLlib actually can, uh, you know, come for free for starters. So if you just, you know, go to databricks.com and join the, the community edition, you can literally work for free. You do not even have to start up with, uh, with you know, paying anything. So you can get started for free. The Python notebooks, you have to literally put into the, 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 the online, uh, you know, work, working uh, dashboard that, that comes up. So on, on your web page, you will have this online dashboard and that's where your, uh, you know, Python notebooks will be stored and MLlib and everything can be, uh, you know, automatically, uh, you know, incorporated. So it is not something that you can install on your computer, but definitely AWS, GCP, Azure, they have Databricks uh, inbuilt into their systems as well. And similarly, uh, so most of these platforms that are that allow integration with different kinds of, of um, you know data data sources, 
and that they can do distributed computing based off of the data resources, um, they have become you know, super popular in, in this case. Um, then comes to data ops or, or data engineering. Now data ops, data engineering, again, is a big part of ML ops. Why? Because here we are talking about data not being collected just once, but it's an iterative process. So data has to become always you know, going through the, the flow. It has to be con you know, continuously clean. It, it has to be always ensure that the data quality is good, it is pre-processed, it is stored, so such that storage retrieval becomes super important. And so that's the reason why data engineering plays a huge part in, in ML ops. So again, data ops and, and you know data engineering, it is dominant in most of the companies right now. Amazon, Amazon SageMaker, Google Vertex, AI, they have been able to you know, post a lot of solutions. So in both these cases, you can literally you know, upload bare batches of data and expect annotated batches of data to come back. And again, there has again been a huge boom in the number of annotation-based companies. Um, you know, scale.ai is one of them. You get you know, huge amount of or you know volumes of, of, of data if you send it you, you can get annotated quality good quality you know quality control data back in, in batches so all of that becomes you know part of this data ops uh, or engineering processes and um, most of the data, you know, MLOp startups, they are concentrating on tabular data because you'll barely see uh, a new startup that, that comes up uh, that is looking at image data or it's looking at, um, you know, NLP um, because typically the, the data is, is data stream. So if you're looking at, let's say, you know, Target, Safeway or, um, you know, some of the online shopping companies, even Amazon. So you will see that the data, it, it is, you know, it, it's always a CSV file where it is, you know, this is the time a person logged in. This is what they are the products they were looking at. This, and this is, you know, the final outcome of whatever uh, they had. So this is the reason why uh, most of the data that is, uh, you know, pre-processed and pre the pre-processing parts in most of the ML ops startups is they concentrate on, uh, you know, on, on, on data like that. So one of the tools to do, you know, absolutely no code or, um, you know, absolutely doing it without any, any amount of code, it is uh, Trifacta. Trifacta is, is uh, definitely a, a very strong software. Uh, again, Trifacta is, is already integrated with AWS and GCP. It's actually called, it's called data prep. So what you do is you, you bring your data in, you import your data, and it will automatically find the columns that are non-relevant to your data, and it will remove them. Uh, it will find the columns that have too many NANs in them, so it will remove them. So all of these things can now be done. So then there is a, a, you know, a, a lot of push towards no code you know, data pre-processing as well. Um, I have always a higher preference or at least semi-supervised, but absolutely unsupervised um, you know, no code uh, data processing can be uh, a little tricky because if if an error pops in, then you will have no way of catching it in, in future. So data pre-processing should be a part that is done very carefully, very cautiously with multiple layers of uh, you know, quality control so that whatever happens, you will be able to catch the flaw in the data right then and there it's in, in order to you know, catch a, an error in data in the, in the next parts so when the ML pipeline or the, or the deployment pipeline is, is really hard. Um, and finally, you know, MLOps is, is again a, a market ripe for private equity, in, you know, investors, because in this case, everybody is trying to look at, um, you know, what new company to invest in. So predictive learning, um, again, fintech, anomaly detection, all of this is super relevant problems. And that is the reason why, um, you know, the mid-sized MLOps company, like it says, uh, mid-sized MLOps companies will begin buying the smaller ones to become more valuable to the large companies right so that's the reason why currently there is a push at ml of startups because the expectation are is you know they will merge or collaborate with the mid-sized companies to be you know desirable for the larger companies to then work on in in, in future so essentially MLOps is a great place to be right now because you do see there's a lot of funding and this is very current this is absolutely you know this is uh, last month's publication so we know that this is current and this definitely is, is one area where um, you know, people could, could think about switching to. Um, then the, the other uh, you know, blog that I wanted to show you, this actually covers the, the five AI startup leading MLOps. And again, this is by InfoWorld. Again, this is in, in June. So very relevant and very recent articles. 
Now it says that the first one, first uh, startup in this case, it's weights and biases. So when DB, as uh, you know, some people like to call it, weights and biases again super useful for dashboarding. And uh, whenever you, it can be you know combined with Olab, it can be combined with Jupyter notebooks in, in you know GCP, whatever, wherever you call it. And it, it definitely can have, so, you know, some of the features are very similar to that of TensorBoard. So people who've used, uh, you know, TensorFlow a, a lot, they might be, you know, sending a, a lot of details to TensorBoard. But then if you're using PyTorch, then in order for you to figure out, you know, uh, where the epochs are at and where the performance is going on, um, and also for, for, you know, live or online monitoring, weights and biases is a super useful tool and, and platform to do that. So again, I, I highly recommend you check it out again. It, it has a free version for academic and research usage. Um, you can literally get a lot of super cool plots. You just need to send the, the, the plots there and all the plots get automatically generated for your, uh, for your uh, you know, life purposes. So the, 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 the volume of the, of the you know, dashboards that you can get is, is much higher than uh, you know, anything else, which is uh, in conjunction with uh, you know, uh, let's say a collab setup. So if you're using TensorFlow, maybe, you know, you prefer TensorBoard, which is fine. But if you're using PyTorch or MXNet or anything else, weights and biases can become a super useful uh, tool to use in that case. Selden is another company. It, uh, you know, offers open core uh, offering uh, and the open source, you know, component. It is a cloud native way of deploying models. So in this case, you can do, you know, canary deployments, AV testing, um, you know, multi-arm bandit and, you know, all of that XG boost out of the box. So most of, uh, you know, the, the MLOps companies, either they are focusing more on the data engineering part of it, you know, like the cloud prep, data prep, like we talked about, or they are talking about the, ML pipeline and the deployment pipeline and to do a one-stop shop so that um, people don't really have to get in into the nitty gritty of what are the commands, uh, how to do this from command line, but rather, you know, do it, you know, in a UI fashion. In a, so it, it is, you don't really need to know the Kubernetes commands in order to do that. So uh, for the modeling pipeline, uh, you know, you have TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, XCBoost. These are all of the, you know, the libraries that you typically import in order to, you know, create your ML model. But uh, what, what, you know, what SaaS companies can, can do is, you know, make it super easy so that, you know, or hyperparameterization or coming up with the best model can, can become super easy. So SageMaker in AWS also has a similar offering. Um, you know, you can have all the linear learners, you know, queue them up and it'll tell you what the best learner is and it will also deploy its endpoint. So it's something very similar. So it, it makes learning what the best model and the best hyperparameters is super easy. And also for deployment, like it mentioned, so canary deployments, A-B testing. So this is everything to do with Kubernetes. Once you're going from one version, so let's say you just deployed something with random forest, but now you're saying that uh, maybe, you know, another classifier is, is better. Uh, so maybe booster decision tree. So the next version, rolling out the V1 to V2, now it becomes super easy because the deployment is, is all done on Kubernetes cluster. And it's just one press of a button, which is, you know, invoking the, the commands that is happening in the background. So you just do, you know, hit the button and the whole um, you know deployment pipeline get automatically uh, created and uh, you know deployment happens um arikto's cube flow is definitely uh, you know they, they have come up with a lot of of resources that scale that is mini kf in order to create these uh, you know output pipelines so i, I highly recommend you check out arikto's uh, you know cube flow tutorials as well then um, the, the next one in this case sorry the next one in this case is called pinecone or xylix and this is a vector search uh, is, is absolutely red hot right now. Everybody wants to know about, you know, where vector search is going. Uh, for instance, and it's actually got a great example, uh, a search for Kleenex can return a retailer's selection of tissues without the need for any custom rules or synonym replacements as a language model used for vector embedding. So it, it will search the query space for you know, similar area of a vector space. So this is super useful whenever you come to, you know, non-standard, uh, you know, non-standard applications for machine learning. So NLP. Um, so how would you go about if you search one word, how would it know that you actually meant something else? So, you know, what is the best nearest vector space? Uh, for it for for the search to happen so that you know you return you are returned with the you know best version of the search that that you put in so nlp again is a super hot uh, you know area right now and 
it, it's you know the, this this company is specializing in, in NLP specifically uh, Pinecone and, and, and Xilinx, and then there is Grid.ai. Grid.ai is again it, it's going into PyTorch because TensorFlow has its own um, you know the, it it, ha it has its own ecosystem of its own. So there's a lot of support. There's a lot of material already out there, but PyTorch again the support it, it's relatively newer. So that's the reason why uh, this is a popular high level framework built on PyTorch. Uh, that abstracts, you know, uh, abstracts away standard PyTorch boilerplate and makes it easy to train, you know, over a thousand GPUs with a couple of parameter switches. Again, it makes your ML pipeline and makes your uh, deployment pipeline uh, super easy uh, to work with. So typically what happens when you're, whenever you're doing hyperparameterization search, um, grid search is, uh, you know, a, a standard, you know, method. And that's what it, uh, it simplifies the PyTorch lightning and runs away with, you know, along, uh, allowing the data scientists to train the model with transient GPU resources uh, and, you know, running the code as locally as possible because running GPUs on servers can be challenging if you don't have it on your local system. So making that, interface as seamless as possible so that you know your work is is fast and is again seamless is, is the word here and then there is data robot data robot i already mentioned right so it, it builds your own life cycle uh, from data preparation and the company makes a good pitch for it so again it is supposed to create the data pipeline as you can see there's a common thread here either the focus is on the ml uh, ML pipeline, or it is on the data pipeline. So data robot, as the name, name suggests, it is actually working on the data uh, part of it. So it's a web-based UI in which you can very easily clean, annotate, gather, and you know storage retrieval of data, clustering, cleaning patterns, and everything becomes very, very useful. So this would be very super useful whenever you're trying to figure out the drifts, right? So concept, concept drift, data drift, uh, in, in order to track for them, um, you know, these are super useful. And again, it allows for distributed computing as well. It, it supports distributed some you know computing as, as well. So Hadoop clusters uh, can, you know, as well as to deploy private and managed cloud offerings. So these are some of the you know upcoming uh, MLOps companies. Like I mentioned, as you can see, the common thread is some have a focus around the data, some have a focus more around the um, you know application side or the ML uh, and the deployment pipeline. Now, uh, one of the you know one of the companies uh, that, that I have been you know speaking to is called Nimblebox.ai, and again, it's they they are uh, they are out of India. The, it's a full stack MLOps platform, and uh, as again you, you can see that you know it's your data, your code, everything else, and it's it's a compatibility framework so you can totally bring your own code and this is a one-stop shop where you can definitely interface you know you can have your jupyter notebook you can have jupyter lab ml flow file manager so managing your projects becomes super easy because it is one place where you have everything rather than saying that okay i have one my data engineer is is probably working with a, a jupyter notebook you know, secluded, then ML engineers, they are working on spider. And then, you know, everything is coming together in a, in a GitHub. And then we are trying to figure out, is it KL or mini KF or what's the, what's the extensions that you're using in order to finally deploy. So this is, this makes sure that everything is housed in one place. So that going from the algorithm to your deployment state with, you know, ONNX is, uh, you know, super useful. And again, you can log in, you can sign up and you can try it out, you know, for, for yourself to, to see. So there are, you know, great dashboards and everything built into it but i think the the, the biggest advantage of, of something like this is housing the whole project in one place so the dev data ml deployment everything staying in one place um, that is a super useful resource um, for you to quickly you know try out your proof of concepts and see how easy it is to roll out something from your inception of an algorithm to final deployment phase so that's uh, today's session about the different kinds of uh, MLOps startups and what is happening. Um, I will stop share right now. All right. All right, so that is, uh, you know, all, all of the MLOps startups. Uh, it, let's look at some of the questions. Hello, Venkatesan. Uh, it's, it's great to, to see you here. Any mask or CNN tutorial planning? Um, mask RCNN, sure. Um, I actually did a, a, a deployment on mask RCNN for object detection pretty recently, um, and again, it's a it's a collab notebook. 
And the Colab notebook, what it was doing is again, it was detecting objects, you know, bounding boxes, and it was also doing semantic segmentations inside for, uh, for cars and pedestrians, right? Uh, but if you want something in, in detail, so if you would like me to cover everything from, from beginning, what the, what the model is, how it is working on specific um, you know, images, like if you're talking about medical images or, or anything, please do leave me a comment uh, and I can definitely plan something around that. Uh, the next video that I have actually planned is, uh, I'm not sure if you, if you noticed, uh, I've changed my computer. So uh, initially I was working on an, an Ubuntu, which was a System76 uh, laptop. My recent one, it is again using NVIDIA RTX 3070, but it's, uh, it's an MSI PC now. So what I wanted to do is to show how beginners could get started on, uh, you know, on a Windows laptop for deep learning applications. So that is the next video that I have planned. Next question, web development versus data science job. Hmm. I see this is very, uh, very specific to, to regions, I would say. So for, for instance, uh, you know, in, in US, in, in the Bay Area, uh, I would say the concentration of data science jobs, data engineering jobs, or uh, you know, MLOps jobs is uh, higher. But uh, I definitely see web development. They are, uh, nowadays, they are called application engineers. Um, and in application engineer, you require the same thing. They'll say Ruby, Ruby on Rails or, you know, C Sharp or something to do, you know, more with, you know, ensuring you can, uh, you, you can prep the, the, the web tools, right, in, in a proper fashion based off of what the, com the company wants. I think the name has now morphed into application engineer. So uh, if you're looking into, you know, web development jobs, then I think application engineering jobs would be something you can look at. Um, application engineering jobs, again, mostly, uh, it's, it's more, you will work with UI UX engineers in order to ensure your front end is as seamless as possible. There's a lot of dashboarding that happens in the back end. You work with data analysts, but I definitely will say that the volumes of job, like Bay Area is an expensive place. So that's the reason why here you will have the, um, you know, the more sensitive or the, uh, you know, the one that required more skill uh, a little bit more, but definitely application engineering uh, roles are always there. But, um, you know, I, I would say it's, it's, it's very region dependent. Um, all right, so you're saying an end-to-end -end mask or CNN would be highly uh, useful. Sure, absolutely. So uh, once I'm done with the, you know, getting started with your laptop, I can definitely do a end-to-end -end, uh, mask or CNN so that we can go right from, uh, I, I will always, you know, highly recommend using the TensorFlow Hub because the TensorFlow Hub already has pre-trained models and that's where I started with. But uh, retraining on top of that and how we can do that very easily using maybe Google Vertex AI, I can show you that. And then um, maybe we, we switch from saying, okay, mask RCN and we are working on um, maybe you know, face, face facial detections. And now if we move to medical images, how would you know, that solution look like? So I can definitely uh, you know, get you know, more in there. So absolutely. And thanks for, for sharing. Well, that's all for today. Um, I'm hoping you liked your, the, this, um, you know, short, comprehensive uh, talk about how, um, you know, MLOps. What's the state of uh, MLOps uh, right now, and uh, how, you know, MLOps is uh, the, the startup culture is is happening, and how, uh, you know, companies are are working together in order to work more on the data engineering in the ML engineering and in the deployment phases. We have talked about Kubernetes and deployment in the past, but again, super important is always the, the, the project ideation. If the ideation phase is, is inaccurate, then it's not gonna go anywhere. So I'm hoping um, ideation phase is, is you know, what we give more importance to. And I think the end-to-end -end mask our CNN will be a good example for us to work together on that one. So thank you, Anka Dixon, for that. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I will leave you, uh, you know, with this video uh, today then. If there is any other areas you want 